when we read the Old Testament, we see things that needed to, there's certain patterns, there's certain shadows that needed to be fulfilled in Christ. And when we read the New Testament, we see how all of those details in the Old Testament found its, uh, its expression through Jesus Christ and through the cross and through the ministry of the apostles. So it is very important to read everything in the Word with the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because that's the, that's the point where everything comes together. That's the point where meaning comes to everything. Okay? So when, when you read something in the Old Testament, don't just dismiss it as old and it's law. See how it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ and then see that same glorious thing, what, what you saw and what you read in the Old can happen and, and touch your life, but even in a greater measure in the New Testament. In First Thessalonians 5, there's, a, there's something, it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing that has been carried over from the Old Testament. And it's so simple, and yet it's something that, that people, for some reason, resist in doing. So First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 says, Be happy in your faith, and rejoice and be glad-hearted continually, always. King James, rejoice evermore. You can connect that. We're going to read Philippians 4 a bit later as well. So there's a rejoicing. Be happy in your faith. Rejoice. Verse 17. Be unceasing in prayer. So it's good to always be in a state or in a posture of prayer or fellowship with God. Verse 18. Thank God in everything, no matter what the circumstances may be. And be thankful and give thanks for this is the will of God for you who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? Do not quench or suppress or subdue the Holy Spirit. Do not spurn the gifts and utterances of the prophets. And do not depreciate prophetic revelations nor despise inspired instruction or exhortation. Test all things what is good to that hold fast. Okay, so <laughs> first thing, just a note. A lot of people say, test all things and hold fast to what is good. That doesn't mean you go to and do all kinds of things that you know in your heart is wrong. <laughs> That's not what he says. He says, do not spurn the prophetic words, but test it all into the good ones. You know, hold fast to the good ones. <laughs> all right, so anyway. So be unceasing in prayer. Thank God in everything, no matter what the circumstances are. Okay. Has anyone... Recently encountered some, some circumstances? Anyone? Okay. So, what is a very good response to some circumstances? Thank God in everything. Give thanks in everything. Okay? Rejoice always, give thanks in everything. So, if we just jump over to Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, so they kind of have some kind of a connection there. Again, I say rejoice. Let all men know your unselfishness. The Lord is near. So in the Amplified, it says he's coming soon. But I just want to also just, today I want to underscore the nearness of God. God is with us. So the Lord is near. I want to, I want to connect that rather with God is with you than you know, he's, he's coming soon. He's with us right now. Okay. Do not fret to have any anxiety about anything. But in every circumstance, so there's the circumstance again. And in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. So there's certain things that he built in here. You can, when there's a, some circumstances gathering around you, to destroy you or to whatever, you know? He's placed this in there for you. You can come anytime and make your wants known, but he says, do, the, do it with this posture, rejoicing always. So before you bring your shopping list, rejoice. Before you come with all the circumstances, Get your own attention on him. 
and rejoice in who He is. Rejoice in what He has already done. Rejoice in the promise of the outflow of what is already done. Okay? So you rejoice because you have much to rejoice about. We are not hopeless. We are not without any uh, answers to, to whatever we're facing in the world. And even what we are facing in the world today, globally, I mean, things are getting a little bit bumpy. Um, whatever we are facing, the world has faced much worse during history than what we are facing now. So we can even rejoice and give thanks in that. Okay. So uh, at this stage, we are not being um, tortured for being Christians. We are not being set aflame in the garden of the ruler. Um, to give light in his, in his garden at night. We are, we are not being brutally murdered because we confess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So there's, lo- there's always a lot to rejoice about. Okay. So, but this attitude of thankfulness and this attitude of rejoicing releases so much power because you are no longer focused on the problem that you are facing. You are, not, you are not magnifying the problem, you are not worshipping the problem, but you are focused on Jesus. Rejoicing in the absolute victory that he has already worked 2,000 years ago on the cross. So to get your... Just, I just want to frame your, your viewfinder, your, your scope, through which you view life. Because you can easily be swallowed up by anything that doesn't look comfortable or that doesn't look wonderful to you, okay? It's so interesting that um, people say that during this time in the world, I mean, it's an unprecedented time of peace and stability in the, in the West that we've had for decades. And, and during this time, there's something, people start to see the small things that are wrong and they get so despondent and, and in despair because of the small things because they do not give thanks. Okay? Just, and, and I've said this recently, just to, just to have a bath, just to have a hot, hot water somewhere, you know, to, to wash yourself with. It's wonderful. It's something that generations of people never had. Centuries of people never had. I mean, so this, even though there's Things wrong. I, uh, I'm not denying that. What I'm saying is, there's always something that we can be thankful for. And I think the, the, the center of all of which we should be thankful for is what Jesus did on that cross. Yeah. So whatever the world can throw at you, whatever happens, you know, we're going into election time now. In, so everyone is tense a little bit, you know, and then afterward everyone breathes again. Okay? But... Listen, the, the, whatever happens in the election, Jesus conquered 2,000 years ago. Okay, so Jesus conquered. So that means for you who are in Christ, there is a sure victory, and that victory has been given to you already through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, where is your attention? Is your attention on everything that wants to swallow you up, everything that wants to come in and smash up this beautiful picture that you have in your mind of how your future is going to be? Um, Or is your attention on the Word and what He says and what He's already conquered? So this means that regardless, regardless regardless of Caesar, okay, regardless of Herod, regardless of whatever world ruler, Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead, he cleansed the lepers, and he was always joyful and in peace. He said, everyone who is burdened and heavy laden, come to me and I will give him rest. So, whatever burden the news has placed on you recently, Jesus says, just come. I want to take your burden away and I want to to give you rest. The world will always have its troubles. Okay, so John 16 verse 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you'll have tribulation, trials, distress, frustration. But be of good cheer, take courage and be confident, certain, 
and undaunted. For I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of the power to harm you and have conquered it for you. So there is a victory that is already sure and that's already guaranteed, that's already given. It's yours. But that victory is unseen in a place called in the Spirit, in Christ. And He has given us His Spirit as the fulfillment of all promises. It's all in there. If there's anything good, you'll find it there. Okay? So anything that is good, you'll find a promise somewhere in the Word that guarantees any good thing to come to you. So you are like a big magnet that draws blessings. But that magnet, it's like one of those electric, electromagnets. You have to switch it on. And you can turn kind of the knob and make it more magnetic. So the more you look to Jesus, the more magnetic you become to blessings. <laughs> okay? So your, your attitude and your posture determines the outcome. He's already done everything. He's already given you everything. But now you need to get your attention off of everything that's bothering you. So I think one of the biggest problems we have in our lives today is our tongue. One of our biggest problems we have today, and this is a, a human thing, is throughout all generations, we are just suckers for complaining. We love complaining. Man, we just love to complain about everything. And then God says, okay, but just, just take my words on your lips and just speak it. And you will have whatever you say. No, 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 no. That's not, no. Can't you see what's wrong? Can't you see what's in Christ? And it's already given to you. So in the beginning, God gave authority to man. Let us make man, let them have complete authority of the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, every creeping thing. Okay, so he said to Adam, okay, Adam, rule. And the first opportunity he got <laughs> to rule over the serpent in the garden, he listened to the serpent and he started complaining about his wife. He took, he took the bait. Well, his wife did give it to him. But he was standing right there with all the authority and he said nothing. So don't just stand there. Say something. So the word of God is powerful that it can address any situation in your life right now, even more so after the cross than before. Because we have the indwelling presence of the Spirit in us. We need to understand in the old, the, the Shekinah presence, glory of God, came upon that box with the wings. Okay? They had the tabernacle and they had the Ark of the Covenant inside of the Holy of Holies there. And they had certain rituals and certain uh, ways to move with it. And that the glory of God abided on that thing. God said, okay, it's taken away now. So the tabernacle, was, it was a prefigure. It was a temporary structure. And later there was the temple that was the permanent structure. So we need to see the parable here. And then the temple was broken down and rebuilt. A permanent structure. But we never saw the Shekinah glory in the rebuilt temple. Because it was a parable. Okay? God does not dwell in temples made with hands, says Stephen in Acts chapter 7. All right. So Jesus said, break down this temple. In three days I will raise it up, speaking of his body. So when Jesus came on the scene, he became the embodied fulfillment of all the promises regarding the presence of God that's with the people of God. Now, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, he has bought us with his blood out of every nation and kingdom and tribe and tongue. He bought us with his blood. And he has formed us into a kingdom of priests. So what did the priests do? They sang at the, um, at the Ark of the Covenant. You can read it in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for his good and his mercy and his loving kindness and your faith. So David appointed people, the Levites. And then he appointed, what's his name, As Asaph, to sing the thankfulness of God. And that was his job. Imagine that's what you do every day. That's your job. You just sing the thankfulness of God. 
Give thanks to the Lord for His good and His mercy and loving kindness endure forever. That's what He's saying all that long. Okay? All right? So, priests. But if you look at kings that really knew God's heart, I mean, David is one of it. You can read the Psalms of David. And this is also something that keeps coming. The thankfulness that he's singing towards God. Okay? But something that, that's standing out to me, in Second Chronicles 20, you get the story of King Jehoshaphat. And who was it against him? The Moabites and the Ammonites or something? Some ites. Forgive me if it's the wrong names. Okay? So, he found out that these two nations are drawing up against him. So he was a king and he wanted... God to help the people, to save the people because he knew that they were not big enough to, to stand against this nation or these two nations. So what did he do? He sought to seek the face of the Lord. That was what he wanted to do. He didn't care about anything else. He just wanted to hear from the Lord. Okay. Right. So I just want to jump to Second Chronicles Chapter 20. O oh, our God, will you not exercise judgment upon them? For we have no might to stand against this great company that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. There's a good clue. <laughs> okay. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their children and their wives. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. He said, hearken all Judah. So now the Spirit of God comes upon this guy and he starts to speak. Hearken all Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat. The Lord says this to you. Be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. So I want to just declare this over you. What are you facing today? What is making you to you know, bite and eat out your nails right into the, the nail bed? What is causing you to lie awake at night? It may be death. It may be some sickness. It may be something political. It may be some family relationship. Whatever it is. Okay? Whatever is standing against you. And you, your confession is we do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you, Jesus. Okay? Right, so, God says, Be not dismayed or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Now, we must also remember that Jesus has now already conquered the battle of battles. Even the battle of Armageddon, for those who don't want to believe me. There's a video, don't worry. Okay? Okay, it's the cross of Jesus. He's done it all. He's conquered it all. Tomorrow go down to them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the ravine before the wilderness to Jeriel. Okay, so now he told them exactly what they're going to do. But now listen. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Take your position, stand still, and see the deliverance of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, be dismayed, uh, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Okay. So back to Philippians 4. God is with you. The Lord is near. Fear not. Rejoice. Okay. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping him. And some Levites and Kohathites and Korahites stood up to praise the Lord and the God of Israel with every loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. So now this is the king speaking. So we have the priests and we have the kings. Okay? Believe in the Lord your God, and so you shall be established. Believe and remain steadfast to his prophets, and so you shall prosper. So do not despise the prophetic words. Okay? But test all of it, and you know, I believe prophetic word needs to be tested. I believe that's why we have the prophetic you know, training that we do. Um, if someone gives you a prophetic word, awesome, but just record it. 
And there needs to be some kind of accountability on that. It needs to be tested against the, the Scripture of God. Verse 21. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers to sing to the Lord and praise Him in their holy priestly garments as they went out before the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for His mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Okay. Okay. And when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord uh, set ambushments against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were self-slaughtered. For suspecting betrayal, the men of Ammon and Moab rose against those of Mount Seir, utterly destroying them. And when they had made an end to the men of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. Imagine the last two. Okay, one, two, three, go. (laughs) Okay, they all destroyed one another. And when Judah came to them, the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked at the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take the spoil, they found among them much cattle. Who takes cattle to a battleground? I don't know. Goods, garments, precious things, which they took for themselves. More than they could carry away. So much, they were three days in gathering the spoil. (laughs) Okay, now listen. They were frightened. These guys wanted to annihilate them. Make no mistake, that was their goal, to completely destroy and wipe them off the face of the earth. Okay? They sought the Lord. They did not look to the circumstance. They sought the face of the Lord. Okay? The Lord gave a word. You will not have to fight. But go there and you will find them there. You will not fight the battle is the Lord's. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Okay? So they go. Why did they have to go there? To collect the spoils. Okay? So they were not there to fight and be killed. They were there to collect the spoils because the battle was already given into their hand before it started. So what did King Jehoshaphat say? Say, give thanks to the Lord for He is good and His mercy endures forever. And they s- imagine now, and I've made this joke before, but imagine now you send a bucky with a worship band out on the battlefield. <laughs> and everyone <laughs> with their guitars are singing, give thanks to the Lord. And there's cannons and there's mortars and there's, I don't know much about anything military. There's, there's guns, I don't know. If you like computer games, maybe some Tesla coils, you know, whatever it is that they can shoot you with. There's this big army, and they, they, can't, they can't do anything against them because they are singing praises and thanksgiving to the Lord. Wow. So, in your life, Jesus Christ, you can you see it in Revelation chapter 5, oh, the verse, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. It says, uh, He has bought us with His blood. And out of every nation, kingdom, and tribe, and tongue. So, before anyone wants to say anything, the church is the first multicultural society that ever walked on the face of the earth. Okay? It's not on racial and cultural lines. It's whether you have the Spirit of God in your heart or not. We you believe in Jesus. So we are one. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your language is. I don't care. We are brothers if we have Christ in our hearts. Okay? All right, so he... Bought us with his blood out of every nation, kingdom, tribe, and tongue. And he has made us a kingdom of priests. Just think about that. You have been made a royal priesthood. Or kingly priests. So that means in your life, you can fulfill the same function as David. You can fulfill the same function as Jehoshaphat. You can fulfill the same function as as, um, Asaph, as all of these people, you are the priest before the Lord and you minister towards the people around you. How do you minister the victory towards the people? Well, how about you start praying but pray thanksgiving for what is already given? 
So we are standing even in a stronger position than all of them did. In Exodus chapter 14, here comes Moses with the Israelites out of Egypt. And they are pinned against the Red Sea. And the Egyptians are behind them. And Moses says to them, the Egyptians you see behind you, you will never see again. Okay? Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Okay? See the victory that the Lord will bring about today. He didn't say the, vic- the Egyptians we see. He didn't even look at them. So your perspective is crucial. Okay? What are you looking at in the midst of your situation? You can be swallowed up by the pressure of your situation, or you can be completely consumed and raptured, if you want to use the word right, in the glory of God, in His presence, with your focus so completely on Him that you're not even aware that there's a problem. Okay? You can be caught up in His glory, or you can be caught up in the, in the reality of your problem. But it's your choice, and you need to make the decision. Okay? So Moses said, why do you, well, Moses spoke to God. He said, God said to Moses, why do you cry unto me? You stretch out your hand. So Moses still had to do something. He had the staff over his shoulders and his hand in front of him, you know, like a cross. And, in, and the wind blew the whole night and opened up a way. And they walked through on dry ground. So the Egyptians that came to annihilate them and to enslave them again saw them going through the sea, but they didn't really make a very good calculation because the guy that opened the sea surely can close it. (laughs) So he went through. And on the other side, they started singing the song of Moses. He stretched out his hand and he closed upon the Egyptians. So not only did God deliver them by putting the Red Sea in between them, That would have been wonderful. But he completely destroyed all, all, all of the whole military uh, power of Egypt in the Red Sea. They could never pursue them because they did not exist anymore. And 1 Corinthians says they were baptized into Moses. Now, if you look at, at baptism in your life, there were things that was trying to enslave you through baptism, and you died to that, and that stuff was buried in the water of baptism. It can never find you again. You're a new creation in Christ. Whatever bondage is after you, it's in the water of baptism. If you haven't been baptized, get baptized. Okay? Listen. The victory is given. There's something to rejoice about. Okay? So sometimes people feel like rejoicing. Oh, no, what is there to rejoice about? You know, like Eeyore. Mm. Do you see the cake? No, Eeyore. It's because it's my birthday. (laughs) Okay. Listen, he, he did not say complain before the Lord for that will help in some way. He said <laughs> give thanks to the Lord for his good. And his, thanksgiving is not because God is a sociopath and he wants to be thanked all the time. Praise is not because God is some kind of a weirdo and he wants to be praised all the time. It's for us yeah. to get our attention on him. God knows who he is. He's not, he's not insecure about anything. Okay? All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I've gone a bit off script, but that's, I, don't, I enjoy that, so then let's go for it. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And, I mean, those who know me can already say what we're going to say right now, but it still remains good news. So, Paul and the other apostles did face some situations, Right? So they got actual persecution, not someone saying something on Facebook or someone, you know, 
deleting your post because it went against their guidelines or something. You know, that's not, that's not real persecution, okay? Real persecution is they were in dungeons, you know, and in the middle of the night, they started singing praises to God and the whole place shook and the chains fell off of all the prisoners. Imagine singing praises to God at midnight, you know, taking the chains, making a, making a rhythm and making some melody, and the whole place is shaken. All the chains fell off the prisoners. And here's Paul and all the prisoners, they just stopped this, this prison guard that says, don't fall on your sword, we are all here. Don't worry, we are, we are all here. They were just, the word says, they, they were praising God and everybody heard. It, it affected everybody in the prison. So not only do you get set free, but everyone who hears you get set free. Imagine you're in, in a distressful time. Get some perspective. Get your eyes off of your situation and get your perspective fixed back on the cross, fixed on Jesus, on the ultimate victory that is already conquered for you. Whatever you face in real time is his battle, but it's a battle that is already conquered and he's given you the victory and he's guaranteed it for you. All you need to do is look. All you need to do is not look at your circumstance and then give thanks and praise him. Okay? Instead of moaning and complaining. And you will feel better afterwards, I guarantee you that. Because I've taken both courses. I've, I've taken both routes. <laughs> Thanksgiving's better. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Okay, verse 16. Therefore we do not... Okay. Paul in persecution, right? Struck down but not destroyed. Persecuted, not abandoned. Real persecution. Verse 17. Over 16. Therefore, we do not become discouraged, utterly spiritless, exhausted, wearied out through fear. Though our outer man is progressively decaying and wasting away, yet our inner self is being progressively renewed day after day. Listen, you need to be renewed. Inside your heart, you need to be renewed and refreshed day after day. It's not good enough to. Go on how he refreshed you yesterday or 20 years ago. Be refreshed today. You need connection with him now, today. Okay? So uh, let the hope spark in you again. Okay? Get your attention off of the situation and be renewed. Okay. Verse 17, for our light momentary affliction... The slight distress of the passing hour is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure excessively surpassing all comparisons and calculations of our transcendent glory and a blessedness never to cease. Since we consider and look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are visible are temporal, brief and, brief, brief and fleeting. <laughs> But the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. So it's an eternal thing. It's unseen. It's of a greater quality than what you can find in the natural realm. So that's why God keeps it for you in the unseen. It's of a higher authority. It's of a higher quality. It's of a higher realm. And you have access to that realm. And if you enter there and look, whatever is there you bring here every time you open your mouth, Every time you do something, you carry the glory of God with you. So just to, to get back to the Israelites, they had the, the tabernacle of God. God was with them. They had the very presence, the Shekinah glory of God on the tabernacle with them there. Later on, the Shekinah glory came into Solomon's temple. But now Jesus came, when Jesus came, he fulfilled all of the types about the temple. He became the temple. He became a walking, talking, holy of holies. He became the very place where the glory of God dwelt. He became the, the habitation of God on the earth. And the tabernacle 
that, that was foreshadowed through the tent of Moses has now vested in his flesh body. So he became the real temple of God. Now, he, that body was destroyed, raised from the dead, and he said, all right, now the price is paid. I've made a pla- ready a place for you. I have made perfect atonement for you. Your sins are washed away and forgiven. Receive my spirit. Boom. And he ascended. So now the 11 has the, the spirit. And what happens at Pentecost, they were all in one place in one accord and suddenly sound as of a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire divided, fire divided and sat upon each of them and they began to speak in other tongues because they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So now they all received the presence. Now they all received the glory of God. Okay, so do you want the presence and the glory of God indwelling to manifest to such a degree that it will not only rival but exceed the supernatural manifestation of the glory in the tabernacle? Do you want that in your life? It is given to you. It is yours. And this is the way that we will stand in that manifestation of God's Shekinah presence. And then imagine it corporately if, er- if everyone is in agreement in that, what it will look like. Well, at least like the book of Acts. This is it. Look away from your situation. And look to Him. Don't look at the light momentary affliction. Don't look at the slight distress of the passing hour. Because this slight distress is producing more and more abundantly preparing, producing, achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory, Shekinah. Beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and calculations in a vast transcendent glory, never to cease, verse 18, since we consider and look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. So if you look to the things that are unseen, you see something pure, undefiled, uncorrupted. You see something beautiful, something that is light and life, and something that has, is a power that has the, the ability to conquer anything that resists God in any realm. Okay? So when we keep our eyes on that, if we just jump back one chapter in, in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it says, All of us with unveiled face because we continue to behold in the word of God as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord are constantly being transfigured into His very own image in ever increasing splendor from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So what do you see when you look to the unseen? You see the face of Jesus. And as you behold the face of Jesus, you see that manifestation of the Shekinah presence, the ultimate manifestation of it, as it is produced in the face of Jesus instead of the face of Moses. There's something greater about Jesus than there ever was in the things that foreshadowed him and that predated him. He was the fulfillment. He was the, the... not only the fulfillment of everything that was written about him in the law and in the prophets, but also he is the exact likeness of the unseen God, the representation of the invisible. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. When you see Jesus, you see the full picture of everything that is God and everything that is good and everything that is light and life. Keep your eyes on him. And when your eyes are on him, give thanks. When your eyes are on Him, give thanks, at least give thanks for what you see in Him. Even if there's nothing to give thanks about in this world, give thanks for He is good and His mercy and His loving kindness endures forever. And that posture before God will turn up that magnetic dial, man. (laughs) It It will manifest the Shekinah glory in your life as you look not to the, the, the stuff that's troubling you, but you look to God. There, there's a blessedness, there's a, a transcendent glory that starts to rest upon you. 
there's a, a sure victory that you start to walk in in every area of your life because your attention is not on the stuff that is trying to destroy you. Okay. And I think that is the essence of God being with us. God being with us means the Spirit of God dwells in human flesh. He comes and He abides. He makes His, his dwelling place on the inside of us. So, is there anyone who's never received Jesus in your life? Who has not made a, a definite decision to, to serve Jesus in this place? Okay? Okay, so that means we are a congregation of believers. Okay? That means the very same God of heaven and earth that created everything, the very same God that gave victory to Jehoshaphat, the very same God that brought the Israelites through the Red Sea, the very same God that raised Jesus from the dead in the ultimate display of victory over sin and death, is now on the inside of you all. Okay? Which means we as believers have no excuse for defeat. It means we need to get our attention on Him and cling to Him for our vital necessity. Okay? We need to look to Him and never look back, never look away. Because when we look to Him, that is the source of all life. That is the source of all victory. Your, whatever you are facing is already completely defeated and conquered. So now, in your life, in the reality, in real time, you are facing some things. There are certain things that need to be destroyed in your life. May it just bow the knee even right now. But now, in, the re in real time, Keep your eyes on Jesus. Rejoice in what you see and give thanks. All right. Amen. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. I thank you, Lord, for the word of your grace. I thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice that you made of yourself for all the sin of the world. We thank you, Jesus, that you conquered darkness and death for our sakes and that you now dwell on the inside of us. So Lord, I just speak in the name of the Lord Jesus, I just a blessing over every person, every person watching, every person here. May the blessing of the Lord rest upon your life, and may the blessing of the Lord and the victory of Jesus Christ just conquer everything that's, that seems uh, overwhelming and that seems rough in your life at this time, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. We give thanks and because your mercy and your loving kindness endures forever. Amen.